all right. Uh, this is uh, our, our Cuban cigar show. Everything that you want to know, all of your questions. We got a couple pages of questions asked by our fans. And right now, I am going to light up this fake Monte Cristo Cuban cigar. Um, because you just never know. I mean, I've had some fake Cuban cigars that were actually pretty damn pretty good. Pretty damn good, yeah. You know, um, uh, there, there was a, um, a, a warehouse that got broken into in South Florida. I believe it was last year, maybe two years ago. Mm -hmm. Not the Fuentes where they stole the whole thing and shipped it overseas, but they, um, they had said down in South Florida that most of those cigars were probably going to be banded as Cubans and sold as fake. And I'm like, that's awesome because, well, not awesome, but at least they're people are going to get, they're going to get a fantastic cigar. All right. Like I said, we've got the, uh, uh, um, uh, it's going to be a, a show dedicated to Cuban cigars. Um, by, uh, let me start off by saying that the importation of Cuban cigars into the United States by mail is highly illegal. You can face fines. You can face penalties. I'm not sure if you can face jail time. That I'm not sure of, but it's illegal. Dr. What is the Meal, policy on gifts? Um, that I'm not sure. You'll have to ask Dr. Meal that one. But uh, Dr. Meal is not promoting, nor will he advise you on how to procure Cuban cigars illegally. Dr. Meal is a world traveler. He goes to these other countries. He brings them in. We'll ask on what you can bring in. I know I thought there was a limit. Someone told me $300. I've seen $600 on how many Cuban cigars you can bring in. We'll have to ask him about that. So all the cigars that he procures, he does legally because he is a worldly man. So with that being said, um, I'm going to show up a picture here. Um, uh, Dr. Mio was featured in Cigar Aficionado Magazine Contest um, for Best At Home Cigar Lounge. He ultimately took second place. So if you want to see where the good doctor is sitting from right now, this is his home lounge. Um, this is where uh, this is where he's at. So um, just just think about that as, as you're sitting in your garage. But uh, I mean, like that is just I saw that and it's absolutely beautiful. Um, you should see uh, uh, first, second, third. Um, it's really weird how close together first and second was. But um. Our guest tonight graduated from Southern Adventist University in 1987 with a degree in chemistry. He graduated from the University of Miami School of Medicine in 1991. He was a physician internist at the Florida Department of Corrections, and he is now a full-time physician at Bayfront Health in Punta Gorda, Florida. And if one person asks him about COVID-19 masks, I'm going to boot you from the whole show tonight. Don't even bring that shit up in here. We're here to have fun. So let's get right to it. Waiting patiently in the southeastern guide dogs green room is uh, the man, the myth, the legend himself, Dr. Emil. What are, you, what are you smoking tonight? Uh, I'm smoking one of my favorite regional releases. It's a Por Laranga Asia Pacifico from 2008. Okay, so Por Larang. How did you say that? Por Laranga. Okay, so I always thought it was Laranya, as in it was like a Y that was in there. That's the way it was. See, that's, that's what gets me messed up with all these Spanish names. <laughs> <laughs> it's not easy. It, it, it is not not easy um, at all. So um, I had showed everybody a, a picture of your um, uh, your lounge, the one you built at your house there. Um, yes. what, what people may not know that had that contest, first and second place, both in Florida. Third place was in Alberta, Canada. But the guy that took first place, what does he live, 15 minutes from you? 15 minutes. It's unbelievable. Did, it's, it's, did, oh did, both of us in 15 minutes. What are the odds? Then now, have you been to his place, or have you guys been in co contact? I have not. I've tried to reach out to him. Uh, I looked on Facebook and Instagram. Um, I could not find him. I did a name search because I figured if I could reach out to him, we could go down to Havana Tranquility, have a cigar, take a picture, and send it into CA and see if they posted it. 
you know, and I won a number two. So yeah, I mean, how how strange out of you know, you know, they had to have gotten a ton of entries, and they chose two of them. You know, and and they probably didn't do a Google search like, hey, these guys live next door to each other. Yeah, you know, so they, they don't they don't know. Um, so super super strange. Now, and another thing, I I caught one brief thing in an article that someone interviewed you uh, years ago. Is it true, actually true, that you started smoking cigars after watching Seinfeld? It's the absolute truth. That I is, had, uh, I had smoked once before. A very close friend of mine had a uh, had a baby. This was probably forty years ago. Well, thirty-five years ago, and uh, it was some dime store cigar. It was horrible. And yes, I was watching Seinfeld in the early '90s. I was watching Kramer and was just fascinated with how enamored he was with Cubans, and was able to try one on a cruise and was hooked. And that started my massive obsession with uh, Cuban cigars. Now, now, what what is what is your collection like uh, on on Cuban cigars? So, as in. Um, do you have a, I mean, cause I mean, I know, you know, I, I, you know, have friends online, huge Cuban cigar collectors. Would you be like one of these mega collectors or, I mean, wh how is your lineup? It's really become my passion in life. It is by far, you know, beyond a hobby. Um, and I have traveled the world to meet people and to really learn about this, um, and so I've been very, very passionate and, and used, uh, really, this, this has been my main focus of my resources. So, yes, I would say that my, my, um, my collection has probably gone beyond a normal uh, <laughs> obsession. So I'll do a brief, uh, I don't know if I can flip the camera, so I'll just do this and, and please show you. I don't know if you can see that. That's the walk-in. Wow. <laughs> and then, and then you have a um a, a secret door, right? You know uh, that, that I do. So it's it's, uh, <laughs> it's actually hidden behind a wall sconce. So, <laughs> and believe me, the level of security I have here I want to fool with. So yeah, <laughs> the wall sconce, and it moves over. And it is a fingerprint access. I can assure you, mine is the only fingerprint on the planet that works. And that opens the door. What? Is wow. Going on here? So then the close. You can have 30 man. seconds. Okay, so we're then now. Uh, I'm sure you've got obviously emergency generator, but what do you do when all else oh, yes. when all else fails though, and you need a damn cigar, and the emergency oh, generator is out of diesel and like I have backup I mean, generators, like, not just the whole house generator, but I've got two <clears throat> jet pack gas powered. I can back feed the panels. So whether it's hurricanes or anything else, I mean I'm I'm about as as safe as I can be. The the room is built actually by. The father of one of the guys online right now, Joe Sorrentino, and um, the room was built with a solid core concrete wall, no windows, the doors only one, it's a hurricane door with triple lock system, so theoretically this would be the only thing standing in a Armageddon type situation. <laughs> so that's the place to be. That's the place to be in, in, in Armageddon for uh, for sure. So um, uh, let, let's jump right into it. One thing for people that are um, um, not only watching now, but we get a lot of replays uh, on YouTube, um, and and a lot of things that uh, the questions that I see. I got a lot of questions from other people, but uh, I, I have two questions. One of those is, um, why are so many cigars sold in the U.S. with Cuban cigar brand names like Cohiba and Partagas? How can they get away with selling those here in the U.S. for those that may not know? It's actually a very good question. It's a and then the answer is not that complicated. Back when uh, Castro took over, initially all of the cigar planters had been backing him because they wanted the dictator Batista out. And for the first year, everything seemed to be going fine. And then after a year in power, the tanks rolled up to the uh, cigar plantations and he basically took those over in the name of the state. And all of the private ownership from that moment forward dissipated. 
So most of the long-term generation owners fled the country. And when they left the country, they uh, had hoped that he would be leaving in the next three to five years and they could go back. It didn't happen. So as time went on, they basically used U.S. law to copyright their own names because they owned those names before Castro took over. So they really are the ones that initially had those names. So the courts basically ruled that, yes, from a trademark perspective, they have those names. Now, international law does not allow you to sell the trademarks in the same place. So whereas how you might have a, a Dominican Monte Cristo in the U.S. won't have a Dominican Monte Cristo in Switzerland, Germany, or other places where things are sold. The two cannot overlap. So wherever you see one brand, you don't see the opposite trademark. So oh, that state, I did not know, yeah. Yeah. Cohiba, which General has been fighting in the courts for decades, was not a pre-Castro name. That was developed in 66. And so the courts have actually upheld the latest uh, verdict in the courts was that um, General could not keep that name. They have done so. They're still appealing it. But Ohiba is one of the few actual brands that were created post-revolution. So internationally, that's owned by, by Castro. Okay. Cuba. Now, so with, with that being said, oh, that was uh, hopefully everybody understood that. And um and, and I and I didn't know that about the uh, the Cohiba, and then I didn't know that they both weren't sold throughout the country or throughout the world. So that's that's kind of that's kind of cool, you know. Only you know only, only here in America, I guess. Um, so well, I, I, I think it makes sense if you can if you can get a uh, Cuban Cohiba, then why would you want a Dominican? You know, if you're in Canada and you can buy one or the other. Yeah, you know, I, I'm smoking the uh, uh, the Cohiba Connecticut right now because I lit up this fake Ramon alone or uh, um, or Monte Cristo. That's what I lit lit up was the fake the Monte Cristo, um, and it was absolutely delicious for the first minute, and then it stopped burning. Uh, there was a giant hole. I don't know if anybody can see. There's a giant hole in the cigar, and it is stopped. It is stopped, and it was it was delicious for a, a minute, and then it and then it absolutely sucked. So um, as a uh, as a Cuban cigar aficionado expert connoisseur, um, I, I'm assuming you you smoke exclusively Cuban cigars. But there there you are in Florida, you know the the heart of uh, the cigar world, and so close to Cuba, you've got all the Cuban rollers. Do you buy? Do you have guys there locally that you buy your hand rolls from sometimes that are reminiscent of the Cubans that you seek out? It's, it's, a, it's an issue question and understanding that, you know, your, your taste is a very personal thing. Yeah. Um, I may hate onions, you may like onions. It doesn't mean onions are good or onions are bad, just perceive them differently. Um, I have not ever smoked anything that has not been a Cuban that said, wow, this, is, this certainly reminds me of a lot of the Cubans I smoked. I can tell you that some of the um, some of the very early Tatuajes uh, have a little bit of a reminiscence. I don't think they quickly do uh, as much. Um, and uh, some of the um, very, very early, uh, and the brand is going to stop my head, The King is Dead, Long Live the King. Uh, uh, Robert Caldwell. Caldwell. The early Caldwell, I thought, had a little bit of reminiscence of maybe some, some hints that reminded me of some Cubans. But in general, uh, the Cuban cigars uh, are much milder than non-Cubans. And uh, bad or otherwise, and that's just what I find. Uh, so that if I'm smoking a Padron, if I'm smoking a Davoff, if I'm smoking a Fuente, um, it's, it's a very different flavor profile. It's generally a little bit fuller bodied. It's generally a little bit more peppy, a little bit more spicy, uh, because the, the, the tobacco grown outside of, of Cuba is, is different. It's not worse. It's not better. It's different. That's all. You know, and, and that makes sense when you say the, the, uh, the tatuajes, you know, because that's what Pete Johnson blends. He loves Cuban cigars. Obviously his father-in-law, Don Pepin, you know, Cuban, you know, so, so to have that influence into his cigars, 
you know, um, uh, definitely makes sense. Um, now, out of um, all the cigar Cuban cigars I've smoked, I'm not a fan of Cuban cigars. It's just it's just on my flavor profile. I like you know uh, the the spicier, bolder cigars. Um, but the Ramon Alones, I don't know. Hopefully, I'm I'm pronouncing that right. Um, but uh, Jessica and I we just smoked and reviewed, and it was the the Patagon Connoisseur, and that was actually a, a pretty good cigar. Now uh, I've only out of all the other cigar, Cubans I've smoked, the Ramon Alones is also the only other one that I've liked. Why is that? Why is there something different with from that factory than everything else? The the blends go back many many decades, and the differences between the cigars, even within the Cuban profile, can be very significant. Um, it's funny that you mentioned the Ramon Yone because that's definitely one of the ones I I personally like as as one of my go tos. Uh, the Giganti is one of the best cigars I've ever had. It's and as a interesting side note, if you go back to the mid 90s that was the very first cuban cigar that kramer smoked but i'll just yeah. <laughs> leave that as a side that has nothing to do with the reason why i like it so much but um but as far as the the, the flavor profile you're 100 percent correct and i think that uh, what we see is when the, the the growers initially left cuba they were mainly grown in honduras and dominican republic and those tend to be a bit milder so back in the 70s, 80s, Cubans were known as strong cigars. Once you started having more Nicaraguan tobacco, Mexican tobacco that was introduced, the San Andreas, whatever, things along those lines, much fuller body, much spicier. And I think the American palate has grown accustomed to that because that's what they've been able to get. So frequently when someone comes over and they, they want to try Cuban cigar and they'll smoke it, they say, wow, this just doesn't have a lot of taste to it. It's just not very, very strong. And that, I think, is one of the reasons why, is because our palates have been used to very, very strong cigars. And so we're accustomed to that. And you, it's, it's harder to pick up the nuances and subtleties in, in some of these Cuban cigars. And I personally like to age my cigars, which further tends to take the edge off of the strength even more. So when I'm smoking, I'm really trying to pay attention to the subtleties and the different flavors that I'm, that I'm tasting. and. Um, it's it's a lot of fun to do that. I enjoy that. So, um, uh, our our first question, um, uh, online from Jim Wilcox. Um, what is the best temperature and humidity for Cuban cigars? Now, do you have now in your humidor? Is that strictly all Cubans, or do you have a mix, or do you carry? No, I have a mix. Okay, so so you have a mix. So so what is your what is what is your uh, um um humidity and temperature like? The answer to that question is it's different for what you want meaning if you're trying to age your cigars and when i say age i don't mean six months or a year i mean five to 20 years or more generally you want it a little drier and a little cooler and tend to age a little more gracefully under those circumstances so frequently what i will do is is i have four humidors in my walk-in that are kept at a higher humidity that I'll put cigars in for a couple of weeks before I'm going to smoke and kind of bring them up to uh, more of a smokable type of a, uh, a humidity. So I keep my humidor at about 64 degrees, and about 64, 63% humidity. Um, if I'm smoking a cigar, I like it about 68, 69% for the most part, bring back a little bit. Dryness, but there are people in uh, London, Australia that will store them in the upper 50s, and, um, and, wow. and they come back from that. I mean, they're they're perfectly smokable. I mean, well, just, now let uh, me ask you: Are are beetles uh, a larger concern on that on the Cuban side than they would be on the Dominican or, or Nicaraguan side? Beetles tended to be a bigger problem with Cubans in the past partially due to the fact that the government is totally in control of production. So because of that, there would be times that they would have financial needs. They may rush their cigars a bit, so they may not properly um, address the situation with the Beatles. Um, they, 
Padron as an example, when, when their cigars come in, they come in a pallet and they're put directly into a freezer and they are not sold to the public until they're in that freezer. Um, and so if I'm purchasing cigars, uh, like if I go to Switzerland and I buy a few boxes of cigars, I will freeze before I add them to my collection because I don't want to be left in station. Keeping it at a drier and cooler climate makes it much harder for the, the beetle larvae to hatch if there's any in there. Mm. So when I've had problems, thankfully in a good 20 years, it was when I, uh, when Hurricane Charlie hit, as a good example, we were out of power for three weeks and it was very difficult for me to control the, um, the temperature and so I had a couple of beetle outbreaks, but that was because it was hot and it was humid uh, and that warm up. But I, knock on wood, not seen a beetle since probably 15 years. Thank God. All right. So, so you can. So that was a, a, one of my questions, and I and I didn't know if that was just an urban legend, where you can freeze a cigar, unfreeze it, and it will come back and taste just fine. Many, many, many of the big producers do that. As I say, I was fortunate enough to to be invited down to the Padrones about so. Oh, 12 years ago and met the family and they took me through and took me on a tour and I was shocked to see that. But every, everything that comes in from Nicaragua comes in the back of the factory and it goes right to a gigant, gigantic freezer. So if you've ever had a Padron, you've had a frozen cigar. And I think other manufacturers do, but I just don't have firsthand knowledge of that. Now, now I know a, a couple of them um, uh, here in the States, which, uh, which I found out cause I, I watched it. You know, um, uh, when they um, pack it full of trailers, they put a lock on there, a special lock, tamper-proof, and they actually fumigate mm -hmm. the, uh, the whole trailer before they send it send it down south. You know, and, uh, and, and I'm surprised nobody's got into irradiating their cigars. Like, you know, they're, they're meat producers that irradiate, you know, um, yeah, meat. Yeah, so yeah. I don't know how expensive that is, but you'd think it would be quick, quicker than freezing the cigars, and then that would kill – kill everything but then again you know the radiation people find that out you know it's they start to start to freak out you know that that my uh tobacco is being uh, uh irradiated uh, yeah it might raise an eyebrow or two with that so yeah um uh, now i don't know what this means but ron andrews he uh, asked a meal about the soap note i don't know what the soap note is what is <laughs> thanks ron ron is one of my dearest friends yeah <laughs> uh he is um ron actually had the first cigar store here in Punta Gorda. And um, back when I created uh, Havana Tranquility, I built a store here in Punta Gorda. And Ron was the driving force in helping create that. And to this day, remains the manager of the store, even though I've sold the physical store. Um, Ron, I think because Ron has been in the industry for so long, has an aversion to Cuban cigars and <laughs> has had a horrific aversion to Cuban cigars. Now, what Ron is talking about as far as the note is many of the Cuban cigars benefit significantly from aging. Again, that goes back to the fact that if you're looking at non-Cuban cigars, they're generally either family run, or they're owned by private corporations that care a lot about quality. And so they are very careful to ensure that the tobacco is properly cured and fermented prior to being rolled. And then they're married and they're set in the warehouses for months before they're released to the public. What that does is that dissipates the amount, which is a natural process that occurs when the cigar is rolled. Mm -hmm. When the cigar is rolled, the tobacco has to be very pliable. Otherwise, they couldn't roll it without cracking yep. it. Because of that, they have to over-humidify it. Over-humidify is a bad term. They have to humidify it significantly yes. so that it's pliable the water triggers the ammonia which is a very very small molecule nh3 so it's just four atoms together come out and ammonia is in every plant-based substance on the planet because plants are nitrogen based that's what they are so your much box of cuban cigar that still has ammonia the ammonia can give a very soapy taste so it's very important if you get a box of cubes to, to really try to detect if there's any ammonia when you open it and smell it and if you detect any ammonia you got to put it down and leave it alone for three six months or longer 
and let ammonia dissipate because ammonia to the body is very offensive. It is not something that we anyone enjoys. Yes. Um, so so that that's just one um, making sure that he got his uh, his little dig in there against Cubans, which is fine. All right, so so that you know, so that goes. Tony Costa had a, a, asked a question, and I think that answered it. Why do Cubans get better with age while non-Cubans hit a point of no return? So Cubans just some Cubans just need to be aged. You know, they're they just need not, to go past that sick period because yeah, the rest they're of not, the most yeah, part, they're not right? aged and married together and sat before that they are. You know, b- before they are sold to the public. Yeah, not consistently. That's the problem. It's not consistent. Again, you've got a, a government entity that is taking control of the entire production from seed to cigar, and basically they are serving their needs um, sometimes before the needs of what you'd think the cigar would be. Not always, but sometimes. All right. Um, uh, Quakes30 um, asks, and that goes along with your questions, if the Cuban government didn't have so much authority over their cigars, do you think there would be better quality if it was left up to the individual growers? Oh, well, I, in my opinion, there's no question of that. Um, I've become fortunate enough to uh, befriend uh, Hiroshi Rabanya. I was going to bring Hiroshi up next, yeah. Yeah, Hiroshi is a sixth generation farmer. Uh, they decided, his grandfather decided not to leave when Castro took over. Um, and so they've continued to work their same farm, and they definitely produce some of the highest quality in Pinar del Rio, which is the growing seat of, of Cuba. And they have a lot of pride in, in what they're doing. It, it is a family pride for them. However, a lot of the farms of the Ficas are strictly run by the state. And, and under those circumstances, you are not going to have the pride of having that final product be, you know, something that you're you're so proud of putting your name on. The other thing you have to realize is that when you're looking at, at uh, Padron, Fuentes, these other family-owned companies, uh, they pay wages far superior to most others in the countries where they're making their product. So they can pick the best rollers and attain the best rollers. So because of that, if you've got someone in Cuba who's making, you know, 50 cents a day and has been rolling cigars for 40 years and they're getting 50 cents a day for it, I mean, they're, they're probably not apt to be quite as, as careful as someone who, you know, doesn't get fired from the, the Fuente or the Padrones. So. Exactly. Now, um, uh, I was listening to an uh, interview um, probably like six months ago with uh, Hirochi, and he was saying now that I, I forget what he said. Like he can keep up to like three or five percent of his fields now, his yield for himself, and they're rolling. So if you had some of his cigars that he has rolled from from his best tobacco, oh, absolutely, absolutely. I've got quite a few bundles from him, and okay. they, were, they were all gifts. And um, uh, it is, I will tell you far superior to any production Cuban I've ever smoked um, because he is able to keep back a very small percentage. He is not allowed to sell that. That's very oh. important. It oh, is oh that illegal. I didn't know. Okay. It is illegal for him for to sell a use. cigar. So if someone goes to Cuba and they visit his farm, he will give gifts of those cigars in very small quantities, but you are not able to purchase those cigars, at least not from him. There are people that sell those on the second market, and I would be very cautious of that because you really have no idea what you're getting. Sure. Um, okay. But I will tell you that to smoke, a, even Ron Andrews, who's on here himself, has has smoked some of those um, World Robinas and been very impressed. Uh, so they are... Uh, the potential that is in Cuba is far greater than what you see on the market today, without okay. a doubt, in my opinion. Okay. Um, uh, Michael Rush, we're going back a, a second. If I do come across a box of Cubans with that soapy smell, that ammonia, do I have to store them in a separate humidor than my regular humidor? Is that How do you store? No. You get a box in? No. So you, it's, okay. It's not harmful. It's, uh, as I say, it's such a tiny molecule 
that as it evaporates, it just goes in the air and it, it's gone. So it does not harm other cigars. You could not mix an ammonia-laden cigar with a non-ammonia-laden cigar and have it transfer into that cigar. It does not work that way. You are very safe if you have a smell of ammonia or if you get a, a sort of soapy taste to store it with your other cigars. There's nothing harmful that will happen from that. Okay, right, right on. Um, now, uh, our next question from Askel, uh, Axel Rodriguez, a question I've always had and I've never been able to find the answer to. Do all Cuban cigars use the same seed or are there different varietals? Okay, it's a very good question. And the answer to that is the original, what they believe was the original Cuban seed was a Creole. And back in 79, well, back actually in 58, they had a problem with blue mold. Yeah. And it had decimated some of the crops. It, 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 went away on its own and they didn't have a big problem again until 79. In 79, they had another problem and it basically ruined the harvest and it decimated the economy for the country for that year. And so they were very hard to try to remedy that. Uh, they were using fungicides, but like many things in medicine, uh, like antibiotics, the bacteria can be defeated and become resistant as they see it more they were very fearful that the blue mold would be resistant to the fungicide that they used, which had happened in other countries. So they basically had commissioned their agriculture department to grow varietals to try to come up with something that would still retain the same flavor, but be resistant. It was about a 14 year process of, of using hybrids of the uh, Criollo and the Corojo um, that they had, I believe, 17 different varietals that they had grown for these 14 years. And at the end of that time frame, they had panels because they have people in, in Cuba, just like all over the world, that are, are kind of wired to be able to taste things better. You know how some people can taste a wine and say this is from this year in this region and they're they're real. I mean they have the ability to taste that. Yeah. It's just a neurological thing that happens. Um, they were trying to match the flavors of the original tobacco as close as possible while had something grown that would be resistant. And so the big ones that sort of hit was the Habano ninety two and the Habano two thousand. Those are the two varietals that tended to basically resist the blue mold, the black shank, some of the parasitic infections that were down there. Um, so there are different bridles, and they, to this day, still have different bridles that they use. Hiroshi is one of the people on the leading edge that is working on these. He's got one that's a Habano 2012, that has leaves that are probably three and a half feet long. They're just beautiful and nervous. Wow. So yes, they are different bridles, but the blends are not made up so much of the varietals because, again, they're trying to match the original flavor as best as they can. They don't want to, they don't want to change it if they can help it. But like anything else, I mean, each part of the plant is going to have a different flavor, a different burning quality, a different concentration of oil, depending on if it's the bottom, the middle, the top. And each farm will have different, um, even though growing the same seed it will have a different flavor profile. So it's, the, again, I, I use a lot of parallels with wine, is that if someone is into wines, there are different regions in France, in Napa, and other areas that literally down, down to one farm is the only place that can grow something that provide that exact flavor. Yeah. So if you took a seed from Cuba and brought it here to Punta Gorda and planted it, you'd get a tobacco plant. It would taste nothing like it would grow in Pernod del Rio. It's like if you brought the grapes from Champagne, France, and planted it in Florida, you'd grow grapes. But I can assure you, it's nothing you want to drink. Okay, so so that was uh, that was another question, like uh, uh, Jerome Crawford had. You know, how different was Cuban seed grown in different areas? So Cuban seed grown, you know, literally taking that seed, getting on a plane, growing it in a different region you're going to get a different flavor just because of the different soils and and the growing and everything else correct so, 
So there, there's no way to grow grow a Cuban cigar. And I, I'll tell you a funny story that Hiroshi had told me once that his father was lecturing in Spain and someone had asked him, you know, uh, Don Alejandro, why is it, you know, if you have the Dominican Republic, some of these other Caribbean islands where the latitude, longitude, and macro climates are very simple, are very similar, I'm sorry, you know, don't they taste very similar? And his analogy was that there are two holes that are found in women that are close to each other. <laughs> However, the aroma and the taste is very different right, despite the right, fact that right. they're less than two inches from each other. So, <laughs> Oh my God, I, I, I love Hirochi Rabinia even even more now. What a, uh, what, what a great, I'm gonna remember that story and that is gonna be, uh, that'll, that'll be my, uh, 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 my go-to. Uh, <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. So, uh, uh, next question from Deathinator. Um, is it true that the Cuban government decides which brand gets which tobacco, meaning that Partagas might get the Cohiba Fields next year, and the brand is not fixed quality brand? So, yeah. How does how does that work? You know, do you know? Does Hirochi Rabinia know the, the 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 tobacco he's growing, which cigar it's going in? No. They will not tell them that. What happens is government starts all of the seedlings at their own, in, in their little, you know, growth, little buckets, whatever they are, and they put those in trucks and they take them to the farmers. So the farmers okay. put them in the field as little seedlings. The farmers care for them. They fertilize their every day they're out there doing everything that they need to do and a lot of it they're you know obviously not going to share what they're doing but they take them they they harvest them they grade them they they uh hang them in the barn they cure them and they put them in the palatos and then the government comes and picks those up every palato has you know which priming it was which farm it came from and every part of that is known they then take that and then using both new blends and each old blends make the cigars. So it's basically a recipe book. The third priming from this part of the Pinar del Rio uh, is, you know, uh, uh, two filler leaves and a pargus and Cohiba wrapper is from this farm and things along those lines. And being natural product, they can't get it back from year to year. So they have the tasters that taste the prior years, taste this year's, and tweak the blend as close as they possibly can to try to create the same thing. Now, that said, what has happened, again, because this is a government-run run entity, and again, I don't have firsthand knowledge but from people that I do have a lot of faith in, have said that there have been times that they may be rolling the same Vitola, and they may be out of the Cohiba Robusto, and they may have something that may have been blended as Partagas, and they may have said, well, put the Cohiba label on this. So that is certainly something that has been a critique. Do I have firsthand knowledge? I do not. Um, I can tell you that Partagas tastes like Partagas. Cohiba tastes like Cohiba. Um, Bolivar tastes Bolivar. So I think that if this was happening in any quantity, smokers around the world, there are enough of them out there that would certainly have made comments about this being an issue. So I think if it happens, it happens on a very small scale, but in a communist regime, certainly anything can happen. Yeah, and, and, and to be easy to sneak one in a box, you know, one, you, know you, you, you make 10,000 boxes or something, it's easy to sneak one in every single box and nobody would ever know, you know, right. well, some, somebody would know, you know, you smoke it like, ah, eh, this one seems a little off, right? But at the end of the day, it's still a Cuban cigar. So you would just, you know, you would just still smoke it and, and enjoy it. So that's kind of strange. Now I didn't know they brought him the seedlings. How much does he like when they bring him the seedlings, I don't know how um, he makes his money and what he does, how much does the government provide him with? What, what do they provide him with? Or does he, do they buy those bundles or those pilotos from him? And then he has to care for everything out of the money they give him? 
or do they provide him with sustenance and stuff for the plants? The majority of the farms are owned directly by the government right now. Some of the smaller farms that have generations of knowledge and culture have been left in a pseudo private environment, meaning that they do purchase the product from him and pay it. But there's a total of one customer and there's a total of one set price. So <laughs> um, for, again, I consider Hiroshi the greatest living tobacco farmer on the planet. And I can tell you that he lives in a very simple home with dirt floors. His kids run around barefoot. So the guy is far from uh, uh, being wealthy. So in, in a communist regime, it is definitely the government that is profiting and not the growers. So there's like an illusion of a slight privatization. But yes, he actually has to hire his people. He has to pay his workers. He has to buy fertilizer. Uh, I've gone with him to Miami to help him buy Russian car parts because the only car that he has is an old Russian car that's 50 years old and can't buy parts anymore. There are people in Miami that literally specialize in these old car parts and that he had to pay for that out of his own pocket to take it back and keep his farm going. Wow, you know, because um, cause Diggins smokes Rubinia cigars that we can get here. So so where does that money go to? You know, uh, you know where he, you know, I, I, don't, I just thought that, I mean, looking at him, looking at his interviews, I thought he was like kind of like a rock star. He lived in a house like yourself. No, no, he, he is a rock star because he is a true legend. He, he has tobacco in his blood, his bloodline, and he can do things with tobacco that nobody else on the planet can do. Um, there were years where the Rabai farm would have a yield of 85% wrapper leaves, and the, the second best farm in the entire country is at 30%. So they have a true knowledge and true amazing piece of, of land there where they they are able to produce something like no one else on the planet is able to produce. He's the plant whisperer. The is, as good as he is, he does not benefit. And what is a myth is the Rabinia brand, the Cuban Rabinia brand, not one leaf comes from his farm. Not one leaf. It was a brand made in honor of his grandfather. Oh, and to okay. to show that he appreciated his grandfather's incredible knowledge and, and his art within the cigar world, so they honor him with the name. But none of those none of those leaves are for that. The majority of his leaves, as as I understand, are actually the the top top wrappers. So he is known for wrappers. So generally, the Bahikes, the very very high end, limited, extremely fine wrapper cigars that have no veins color that's that's what his farm is known for okay well so so what keeps him in cuba then is it just is it heritage because i mean i just i just feel like if, if he left he, the, the world is his you know he could live a lifestyle that his family could never dream of yeah so he's going to get his family out they don't they don't ever come with him on these trips Oh, goodness, no, no. I, I was born in Bulgaria. We escaped from a very, very highly communist country. So although not Cuba, I have tremendous knowledge of the way that communism works. And no, they are never going to be dumb enough to let any significant portion of his family out. So there's no getting out for him. Um, not, not with his family at all, no. Wow. I mean, that, that's, uh, yeah, that, that's definitely a, a, a shame. Um, and you had talked about like uh, uh, the limited um, um, uh, releases. Uh, we got a question here from Luigi. Um, are all those limited editions in the recent years a way to mask tobacco shortage? No. What happens with tobacco shortage is they just stop making certain cigars. So they had some really bad, uh, heavy rains uh, three or four years ago that rain is a very bad thing for tobacco plant. It actually stunts it. 
Um, and so they were not able to get the large, pretty rapids those years. So what you saw was a lot of double Coronas, they just came off the market. They weren't continued, they just weren't available. Go to try to find a Ramones Gigante today. They are almost impossible to find because they're still suffering from that heavy rain year back several years ago. So the limited editions, I do think, are a marketing uh, tool, just like every cigar company has. I mean, it, obviously, you're, you go to the IPCPR shows, and you'll see the newest, the greatest thing. They're releasing this. They're releasing that. Everybody in, in the industry markets. They always want new things. They always want all these different thing that will catch the consumer. So I do think that the limited and the retail releases are a marketing by poison that term, a marketing uh, strategy for them to move different cigars. The limited the limitadas are generally a higher prime so that it's a, a much higher off of the plant. So you see that there are darker wrapper and they're generally stronger because the oils are more concentrated. Uh, the regional releases are just made for specific countries that um, will make a certain amount of cigars. They'll make them blend, and then it's a one or two time, you know, and then they're done with it. So uh, it, it makes it collectible, which is smart. Again, um, I think most of the limitadas are overpriced. I don't think they're great fresh. I, there are a few that have just been complete home runs. But the, usually you have to age them for five or ten years to really get their potential. Um, but a lot of them, I think, are not that great. And there are a lot of people that are diehard Cuban connoisseurs that basically avoid limitadas. They just like them. Okay, yeah, that, that one, that, uh, that connoisseur, whatever, uh, the Patagon that uh, Jessica and I smoked, and that was, you know, I guess a limited edition or whatever it was. But it was, it was $53, you know. I mean, luckily, they were sent to us by a, a wonderful young lady, guest on the show, lives in Canada, uh, a Cuban cigar connoisseur herself. But, yeah, and it was it was like a 35-minute cigar. It was $53. And, you know, it just blew me away, you know, at the, you know, at, at the price of, of some of these Cuban cigars. Now, there are Cuban cigars that are 8 to $10, but when you get up to these – I don't know, fifty dollars cigars. That just, especially for these limited editions, that's just. I I, I don't I don't get it. I, I just can't see spending that money. It it is crazy. Oh, there's no question. It's 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 a very marketing uh, strategy that that is used very successfully. Um, and I'm not saying that some of them are amazing cigars. There are. Uh, I mean, I've got some cigars that I am just blown away with that were either a regional release or a, a limitata. Um, but I would say they're, they're a minority. And so it's very tough. Um, you know, if we had them available here in the state, you could go out to a cigar store and buy one or two sticks and see if you liked it or if you thought it had aging potential. But uh, unfortunately, if you're going out to, you know, wherever to buy them, you're buying them by the box. You're, you're really not buying them as a single. And you're taking a chance, so you miss. Man, and uh, you're talking about some of these these rare cigars. Uh, someone had uh, messaged me a question that they'd rather not say who who they were. Um, and anybody that um, that I answer a question, I said, um, let me know. Um, and which I know on the YouTube channel, I said, you know, we'll we'll give you a discount code. We'll send you something free for asking a great question. So there's a couple of Luigi, uh, Michael Rush, message me after the show. But this guy didn't want to be mentioned. But he said, um, have you had the Fonseca Invectus, and is that the rarest of all Cubans? It is not the rarest of all Cubans. Okay. I have not had it. Invectus is actually a very odd-shaped cigar. And what is considered the Bible by most people as far as the post-revolutionary Cuban cigars is this book. Okay. The book has been out of print since 2002. It's very difficult to find. The author, several authors based out of Hong Kong and, you know, very large in the Cuban industry. But they've gone through all the brands, broken them down. It's all opinion. Opinion. Understand that. Uh, but the Invictus was considered and is considered to be the best mild cigar. Um, 
it is it is not a strong cigar. This particular author feels that cigar is the best balanced and best flavored of the super mild Cuban cigars. All right. So, so what would be the rarest pre-embargo, you know, and post-embargo? What, what's like the rarest Cuban cigar out there? And, and like, what are the, and what do they sell for? Well, I mean, there are cigars very sought after. Uh, they may or may not be all that great, but I mean, what, what people usually hear within the Cuban cigar world is the Davidoff Cubans, um, at, and the Dom Perignon is probably the most famous of those, the Dunhills. And these cigars through auction out of London can fetch anywhere from 600 to thousand dollars per stick. Um, so very, very, very pricey cigars. Um, you would get a lot of arguments from some of the ultra connoisseurs that they are worth their price. Um, but some of the rarest cigars were the original uh, humidors that were released in 1994. Um, there are, there's a of, of these super rare cigars that very few collectors have because there were so few of them that were ever made. But these are very, very difficult cigars to find. Interestingly, probably the great concentration of Cuban cigar old time collectors is Hong Kong. Um, it's it's London is probably sex, but but in Hong Kong people have been very highly prizing these cigars. So you have people that bought many many boxes of these cigars that will still have these to this day. But um, the Dom Perignon probably eight hundred to a thousand dollars a stick, uh, even more. And the biggest problem with buying these, these cigars, and especially pre-embargo cigars, is if these cigars were at any point not kept properly, they're dead, and you can't bring them back. Yeah. <laughs> if, if, if during a 60-year run or a 50-year run, for three months, they dried out or they got hot, you can get rid of them again. They can look and feel like they're good cigars, but they're, they're dead. There, you got almost no taste. The so oils, right? that's mm-hmm. the problem: is finding cigars that have been properly preserved to to really be able to say, "Wow, this is the potential of that." Um, Coronas has, and again, I think most people are aware of this, but pre-embargo cigars are completely legal to sell in this country because they they were made before the embargo, so they are not part of the embargo. Um, so you can purchase these cigars, and I've seen some amazing cigars at Coronas that look like they're in incredible condition. They're from the 40s and the 50s. I've, I've never personally purchased any of those, but I can tell you visually they look really, really good. Would I be willing to risk, even for a completely unknown brand, four or $500 a cigar? Probably not. I, I've got other places I can put the money that I'm a little sure in. Would I pass one up and gave it to me? Of course not. Of course not. Yeah, I, I've seen a, a Jeff at Corona his uh, his collection and some of like you said some of those cigars, you know, two, three, four, five hundred dollars per cigar, you know, just for a pre embargo cigar. I don't know, you know, because I, I know he bought those at I believe he bought all that at auction, and it's like yeah. how do you know, you know, your your life, you know, your lifespan of that, you know, or your provenance of that cigar where it's been and you know uh, to, to... And that's the toughest thing is is in, in purchasing these things in auction they need a pedigree of, of showing where were these purchased where were they kept who owned yeah. them how were they kept. so if you have something that was kept at a Davidoff store in London that's been there for 60 years it's pretty good that it's gonna it will have been in good shape the whole time I don't know that you can find any more of those but uh, the place people find these cigars are our collection, i.e., if I walk out tomorrow and get hit by a bus, uh, there's no one in my family that gives a damn about any of these cigars. So these cigars will then go on the marketplace, and someone out there will get to purchase these cigars, probably at a very reduced price over what their market value is, and they've been kept in perfect condition because I've kept them in perfect condition. But it's a crash. How do you know that that person has done that? Exactly. Exactly. I was just uh, re- uh, watching an interview the other day, and uh, um, someone he had a, a very large Cuban cigar collection, and he inside his humidor he has got a spreadsheet 
with everything that what the cigars are worth. So in case he said, in case I die, because he's old, um, someone comes in, my kids or grandkids or someone else would be like, hey, does anybody want these cigars? A dollar a piece, whatever, you know, so they'll know exactly what these cigars, you know, are, are worth. So, um, yeah, I, I God, that, that's got to be scary. Um, you, you're talking about Davidoff. Stephen Wells asked, um, and I don't know the, the, the story of this, but um, did Davidoff really burn all the tobacco in their warehouses when they left Cuba? Okay, and third-hand information, but uh, I've been able to speak to there, there's a gentleman who currently is the world um, manager for Patoro. Patoro is a brand based out of Switzerland, and uh, the two owners, one of the two owners, is one of the grandsons of Dr. Schneider that had purchased the store from Zeno, and Zeno remained ambassador until his death for Schneider and you know kept named David Oscar. Yeah. But, but he actually, I, I asked him when I was in Switzerland not long ago because he knew. Zeno, and he was around when this happened. And basically, there was a there were several factors that involved. Uh, what what Z, what Davidoff said is that the quality was dropping, and that he was unwilling to put his name on the cigars of inferior quality. Probably, more likely, what had occurred was when. The Cuban government had allowed Zeno to make his brand Davidoff. They were assuming it would be very small market share because they were basically splitting the profits with him. And because he was such a good tobacconist, and he was the tobacconist to you know prime ministers and all the movie stars and everyone who was anyone, his brand went through the roof. And so there became somewhat of a dispute among the the way that the uh, continued payments would be. And so Zeno did make quite a few cigars and did burn them in the street. Now, inside information has it that quite a few of those old Davidoffs were not burned and they were put in warehouses and that they still exist to this day um, that once the Cuban government changes um, that they may still be available to a select group of people. Hey, that'd be, yeah, that'd be cool. Um, I, I've wow. heard this from a gentleman in Hong Kong that I have a lot of faith in, um, but I have no firsthand knowledge of that. But um, what what the Cuban government did was, if you look at the time that Davidoff was discontinued as far as the Cuban brand, that was when the Siglo series came out. So that was when we had this Cuba Siglo 1, Siglo 2, Siglo 3, Siglo 4, Siglo 5, which matched the same sizes that Zeno was selling. So the feeling is that Siglo series were the same blend that Davidoff was selling up until that point. And so they <laughs> incorporated those into the Cohiba line. Okay, so so the different Siglos, the, the one, two, three, those are just different sizes. Those aren't different blends. Blend. Different blends and sizes, yes. Okay, different blends and sizes in the Siglo. Okay, so I, I was I've always seen those and I wasn't quite sure what the difference was between those between those cigars so different sizes and different uh different blends yeah so all right so uh, uh St stephen also asked uh, um, a question uh, there are rumors about cuban tobacco being used in some non-cuban cigars people say atabe uses cuban tobacco does cuba export any cigar tobacco that you know of that ends up in any other cigars worldwide. Is any is any tobacco snuck out? Well, clearly, in any kind of an oppressed society, you have a thriving black market. It always happens. So, yes, there is no question that there is tobacco being taken off island and that is being utilized in cigars that are not able to state that they're using Cuban tobacco. Um, I do know that the owner of Atabe has a lot of roots in Cuba. Um, I will tell you, you know, I, I smoke Atabe, the Lord Byron. I have no reminiscence of Cuban cigar when I smoke those cigars. Okay. Doesn't mean that there isn't some Cuban leaf in there, but they are much stronger than any Cuban I've ever smoked. So if there's Cuban leaf in there, it's not a lot. 
Um, but without a doubt, there's a black market that is taking tobacco off island, but again, in very tiny quantities, not in any significant quantity the government's going to find out about. I mean, they had a massive shakeup back in, I think it was 15 or 16, where a lot of the highest level executives within the Bono's brand were all terminated because they were participating in this gray market. Um, okay. Not necessarily just the raw tobacco, but also mass cases of cigars that were just disappearing and going out the back. So yes, it happened. And it probably happens to a degree. There's no way to prove it. I mean, if you did, then it would stop the source immediately because the government would do something about it. Yeah. All right. So now, now the, the, the current Cuban government, Castro was, no matter what you think of the man, you know, policies, communism, everything, he was a true lover of cigars. He loved cigars. What is do you do you have any insight on on what the uh, um, the regime and the current Cuban government is? Are they lovers of cigars or now it, it's just about the money? Because as, as I hear about you know you know Castro just focused on quality, you know the, the Cuban cigars. Is it just about the money now? In your opinion? In my opinion, right now, for the most part, yes. Okay. Now I, I will tell you again, for my palate. Personally, um, I get great enjoyment out of those cigars. That said, I believe there is potential that has far not been tapped as far as what can be done with Cuban tobacco. If it's, if it's this good through a government-run entity, imagine how good it would be if you had the Padrones back there, the Fuentes back there, Pete Johnson back there, caring for the tobacco, blending it. You know, coming up with all these different varieties of tobacco and blends, it's limitless. I mean, it would be incredible. Do you, do you think we would ruin it as as Amer and, and I don't want to say that negatively, so don't people don't don't you know don't don't take that as Americans. Do you think we would ruin the Cuban cigar industry? Yes. yes. I, 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 here, here's here's what I've always thought would happen because I thought for a while when Castro was very ill and when Trump was about to get into power. I was highly hopeful that you would see the embargo lifted. However, if you look at history, when the cigar boom occurred in this country, about the same time that Cigar Fishing Auto Magazine came out, mid 90s, early 90s, yep. you started seeing the interest come up. And then within three or four years, you had a uh, cigar bar in every corner. All the celebrities had cigars in their hands. It was the in thing to do. Cuba was a little bit behind the times because this, this boom really happened mainly in America, not so much the rest of the world. So initially, the Cuban production was not affected. Now, one way or another, a lot of Cuban cigars made their way into the States. And so, although it was a little delayed, as the boom and the demand increased, there was pressure on the Cuban government to produce more cigars from a dollar's perspective. Yeah. So when you look at boxes that start in 98, 99, 2000, 2001, it is the most inconsistent time, the, the, the dark time of, of the Cuban cigar. Uh, partially at the same time you had Russia had backed off on their support, so a lot of the raw material weren't there, so they had a massive increase in demand, and their ability to produce was decreased. So what you saw were terrible cigars coming out. You saw, uh, you have cigars that are unsmokable. They're, they're absolutely rolled, inexperienced rollers, much too tight, and, and you just, you can smoke them. So if today, the U.S. were to lift the embargo and it became legal. Now, the other legal problems that would have to be dealt with, including the, the trademark issues. So it wouldn't be overnight. Yeah. Because there would be a lot of court battles. If you allowed the U.S. market to legally purchase these cigars, I think you would have another increase in demand and it would take years for them to be able to catch up as far as maintain the quality because they'd have to put more raw materials, they'd have to get more farmland, they'd have to put more farmers. And as you well know, just because you grow a seedling today, it's years before that's ready to smoke. So I think that there will be a big decrease in quality for a time frame once Cuban opens, whenever that is. 
Will that be a year? Will that be three years? Will that be five years? I'm thinking four to five years personally. Yeah, that, that's what I, I would think. You know, it, it would be, you know, it, I was thinking five to ten years, you know, you know, uh, the U.S., the number one, you know, smoking country, you know, in, in, in the world. You know, like I said that, that that's what the demand would be. Everybody would buy everything. But luckily, like I said everybody would just well, most people would just enjoy They'd be, This is the best cigar I've ever had. You know, I don't know how many people I've met. You're like, hey, do you smoke Cuban cigars? I'm like, well, not really. They're, they're kind of hard to get. And you're like, that's the best cigar I've ever smoked. I'm like, how many cigars have you smoked in your life? Well, it was just that one, but it was the best. And I'm like, all right. So, yeah, so it doesn't make any difference. So, you know, so what are your, you know, Shane Cheshire asked, uh, what, what is your thoughts on the embargo? Um, is it, you know, it, it's tough because there's a lot of geopolitical stuff behind the embargo, you know, whether we should still be, you know, should we lift the embargo? If we lifted it, would it benefit the uh, um, um, the people? You know, especially with the communist regime. Um, I, I I don't I don't know. I I don't know how to answer that. You know, and um, I, well, you, have, you have thoughts again. Everything I'm telling you is is opinion. So, yeah. um, the it it made no sense in my mind that. The reasons that are given currently for the embargo could be applied to almost any other country that has human rights violations. China, the Middle East, I mean, if we choose to do business with the other countries, why are we still following this antiquated embargo against Cuba? What yes. differs Cuba from any other communist or dictatorship? on the planet that we as a country do business with? I haven't found that answer yet. The answer is that it is a political pullback that of course many, many Cubans came over um, during these oppressed times and have a lot of bitterness because their land was taken, their possessions were taken. Again, I get that. The same thing happened to my family in Bulgaria from generations back. When the communists left a lot of that stuff did finally get back to the original owners but now you've got problems is that if the embargo has been going on 60 years and you've had the government has put different families on the land for 60 years who really owns it does it go back to the original owner you know where does it go i don't know but clearly if the embargo were lifted everyone in cuba would benefit the government would benefit by far more than anybody because they're going to take they're going to take the, uh, the profits. But the same thing can be said about China. Yet we still purchase things that we know are made by child labor, yeah. you know, slave labor, all that other stuff. It doesn't prevent us from buying it. We yeah. still buy it. So if I think, do I think that if money were to flow more into Cuba, it would increase their infrastructure, increase um, tourism, and benefit everybody? I do. I think it would be disproportionate. The government would receive the vast majority of the benefit but without a doubt, the people would also benefit too. All right. Now, so now a question I've had because you you've seen that or I've seen this online, different articles, and um and and so you're you're the the first physician that, that I've ever you know been able to interview and talk to this about. Um, and this is a question from me, not from a listener. The, you know, they, they say Cuban uh, um the the medical field in Cuba is, is almost second to none. Like it, it's an amazing like breast cancer like. That's unheard of in Cuba. Like you know, it's just you know, is is that something that's true? Like the uh, the medicine and medical field in Cuba is absolutely phenomenal. From a firsthand perspective, what I have seen is that the science is definitely. They have extremely well trained physicians. They have extremely um, good abilities. But the fact that the resources are scarce, most of that does not filter through. To common people. Okay. So although there are definitely um, resources that are available under a nationalized health system in Cuba, you're not going to have the level of access to health care in Cuba that you are in a country like the U.S. Now, that said, the same argument can be made for socialized medicine in other countries, you know, Norway, England, name it. I mean, if someone is 55 years old in England and needs dialysis, well, guess what? 
we're sorry. A limited amount of resources, and we're not going to waste our you know dialysis on you. So those hard choices have to be made. So healthcare is a very, very, very difficult subject to address. But the, the short answer is yes, they have good technology. Yes, they have very smart physicians. Most of that does not filter out to the majority of the population. Okay, great, great, great answer. You know, and, and I hear that from my Canadian friends as well, you know, that, that have, you know, uh, universal health care. And uh, they, they actually, you know, we get quite a few, which my friends, Canadians that, that come to the U.S. for health care, you know, because it, it's, it's cheaper and they can get stuff done faster, you know, here in the U.S. than, than they can in Canada. So they say, you know, people always say, you know, universal health care, you know, watch what you, you know, or, you know uh, watch what you wish for. Because like yeah, yeah. it's, it's definitely not the greatest thing, you know, out, out there. So um, uh, Jamie Colazzo, um, which I don't know what this is. I just wanted to know what the Cuban twang is and what is your interpretation of the Cuban twang? What, is, what does he mean by that? I, I I really don't know if he's referring to maybe a specific flavor or something. I, I, I hate to say, it, but the Cuban twang might all might almost be cigars that are too young that have some ammonia in it that are, have kind of a tannic taste to it because they're not quite ready to smoke yet. But that, that's what that's I what never, I was thinking. I was yeah. So yeah, that that's that's definitely what what I thought as well. When he says, like, when I think of a twang, I think of almost like a bitterness, you know, when I, when I hear that term. Uh, like that soap that Ron Andrews is talking about yeah. could be the could, could, could be the uh, uh, the Cuban uh, twang. So uh, uh, William Crawley asked, um, loose bands on Cohibas. I've noticed all the legit Cohibas I've purchased from reputable people with codes at check. Black light tested, true Cohibas. We're gonna get more into that in a second. Across the board, Sig one, two, four, six, Cobro, Esplendidos. They all have loose bands. Is this common? Um, absolutely not. Uh, the one thing I can tell you as far as loose bands is if you age tobacco and if you're aging it in the slightly drier and slightly cooler conditions, um, to coin a Seinfeld uh, uh, saying, you remember shrinkage? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, oh, the cigars okay. will shrink too. So as you age the cigars, as the oils dissipate, tobacco tends to contract a little bit. So yes, on old cigars, I do see um, a loose band as being something that would be more common, but I'm talking a 20 year old cigar, not a newer cigar. I have many, many boxes of Cobas, and I have not ever noticed a band difference uh, as far as their comparison to any other Cuban or other cigar. Um, so I, I, I mean, a, the black light test, you know, they're looking for seal, they're looking for things along those lines. All of that can be counterfeited. I mean, pretty much anything can be counterfeited. Um, I'm not aware of it. I, I have not experienced it personally, nor have I heard of Cohibas having loose bands. Um, I'm, I'm happy to walk over and randomly grab a box <laughs> of cigar right now if you want me to check the band, but I've never seen it. So Okay, now what did, what did he mean by, um, uh, um, so codes checked, black light tested. What, what do those two terms mean? Well, in, a, in an effort to try to curtail the counterfeiting, um, Abanos has assigned code numbers on the seals. Um, something the drones started many, many years ago. Yeah. Uh, the drones were counterfeited uh, because again, any luxury product would be counterfeited. So what Padron did is they basically started putting serial numbers on their higher level cigars to combat counterfeit and that they would actually track and you could check with them. So the, the Cuban started doing something similar where the seal have a barcode and it's an actual serial number and you can go on Habano's website, you can type in that code and it will come up and say whether it's a legitimate code or not. Now, what to prevent me from manufacturing that exact same code on 50 boxes of Cuban cigars and selling them, and then you would look at that code, would come up Check as it. a 
legit code in yeah. one box. So all that is counterfeitable. The black light is is almost like money, where there 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 is something on seal that if you put a black light on, it will show up. Kind of like holding the U.S. currency up against the light and seeing the little hologram stuff in there. So again, with technology, anything can be counterfeited. Okay, so and and it, and it still boggles my mind that Cohibas. You know, I, I was you know, and, and and my brother-in-law, no way he he's watching tonight. He never watches, but um. I was at his, you know, his house a couple years ago. He goes, he goes, hey, he's a cigar smoker. Goes inside. I got a couple cigars for, for us. So he goes inside, gets them. He's walking down the stairs. We're in the backyard having a barbecue. He's probably ten feet away from me, and I don't know why I burst this bubble. But uh, he was ten feet away. I go, you know, those are fake, right? And he's like, no, no, I, I got a guy. And I go, no, I can tell from here. You know, they're they're fake. You know, it's, I I don't understand how more people just can't do the research cohibas now like i sent you earlier like this like this monte cristo this is a very plain band i wouldn't even begin to know how to tell whether this was a fake cigar yeah you know? supposedly uh, it's abrased and bossed and I, I, uh, yeah. I, I don't know you know on, on cohibas like i said you know especially you know and and people say well the, well the band it checks out it's got the squares it's got this the indian head and the only way that that i would know how you know because you know from the research i've done i'm like well show me the whole box because i know the whole box cannot vary in color so if you have right. you know, if you have the entire box every single cigar <laughs> looks the exact same okay there's a probably a pretty good chance that cigar is real no, there, yeah. there's a lot of things if you when you train bank tellers on picking up counterfeit money they don't show them thousands of counterfeits they get to know the real product that's how you know a counterfeit it's not just counterfeits it's study the real thing so if you're smoking it, if you're looking at it, you know, the, the real thing will be something that you can take. Um, again, with technology today, it's not hard to counterfeit band boxes, but there are so many things that you had pointed out. I mean, there are, I think, 67 shades of color that are in the Cuban um, uh, palette, if you will. And so they have, as they're going through their cigars, they have people that, again, have a genetic predisposition that can see color very, very well to take these cigars and put them together to match color. Within a box, you'll always see that the darkest, even though it may be a very subtle, the darkest shade will always be on the left. The light shade will always be on the right. But most people won't even be able to tell a difference in those shades because they are so incredibly close but they do match them very, very closely. And then again, in the box, that color person is looking at them. So they're, you know, always dark to light, left to right. So dark to All right, left to right. And um, then when I, when I sent you the picture of the Monty that I had, you'll notice that it's rolled in in tubo method. So yeah. that they're, they're, if you look at the foot of the cigar very carefully and look at the way that it's made, it's not an accordion roll, it's an yes. tubo roll. So that's one of the first things I look at is people will send me pictures, is this real? Well, you can only tell so much from a picture. Sometimes the picture is enough. Um, but I like to look at the foot of the cigar. I like to look at the consistency, the amount of stems, um, the way that it's, that it's rolled, the color differences. You're not gonna see a lot of real dark and real light tobacco in the foot of the cigar because it, they, 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 that, that's not the way they're blended. Um, okay. On Cubans, you see that a lot. You'll see, you know, one leaf of Lajera will be oh, yeah. bell on the foot. It's, oh, wow. Yeah, I can see that. You don't get a lot of that in the Cubans. They're, they don't vary that much in their color. So. Okay. And then, and then you used a term that is driving me insane on trying to figure out how to pronounce it. I have heard entubo, entubar, and entubado with a D. So what, 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 how do Cubans pronounce that? Because that's how I, don't, <laughs> I say, I say the intubo method. I, I don't speak Spanish, so uh, don't go on my pronunciation, but okay, it, okay, it is Scott Weeks, who, um, who owns a company called Recluse, um, had put out there that all his cigars were going to be rolled in the tubo method. And it's interesting because they do draw very well. It yeah. is, it is a little bit more time consuming to roll in the intubo method um but most of the 
uh, non-Cuban cigars are not rolled using the tubo method. They just aren't. Okay. And uh, uh, Luigi here asks, uh, is it true that not all the brands are sold worldwide in Casa del uh, Habano's stores, e.g. Diplomatica? Yes, that is true. There are there are, the Cuban brands are you've got the main brands that they put everywhere, and then the smaller brands are available in in much less quantities in in different regions. Um, most of the this was a more of an issue probably ten or fifteen years ago um, than it is now. But you look at some of the small brands, the Porlar Young, the Ramon Yones, uh, uh, the Quintano. They're, they're not available in a lot of places. They're a very small production, and and they have a small following, but they're not the well-known Monte Cristo, uh, Bolivar, uh, Partigas, Cohiba, you know, the core group that everyone knows as far as the, the Cuban cigars. And Cohiba is going to be very expensive because it can be. I mean, it's it's uh, it's their flagship. Um, you know, if you buy Rolex, you're going to pay a lot of money. Does it keep a better time than a Timex? No. But yeah. People are willing to pay for it, so thank it. Exactly. You know, um, and, and I said that that's just that band. You see that band. You know, the the checkerboard. You know, the Tano Indian. Um, that's just that. That's just you know. I'm, I'm smoking a Cuban. You know, that's what you can present to your friends. Look what I'm smoking. You know, this Monte Cristo, very plain band. You know, it's just it's hard to. I guess hard to brag about that cigar. You know, people are like, eh, whatever. You know, it's you know, you 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 couldn't you couldn't get a Cohiba, you know. So, but um, so another question, uh, uh, cigar artistry. My good buddy Gerald asked, um, and we'll get into this. Um, well, what is your favorite non Cohiba Cuban cigar and why? So I'm not sure if he means like, is is there a uh, a Cohiba that we can get here? That that you that you like is there you know um, um, a Cohiba brand that 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 you smoke or is it just all you know you just don't because I'll be honest with you as in the Cohiba brand that's not a cigar I super care for. No, no I agree with you on that. It's not in my palate. It's not in my house at all. Um, there are people that are very loyal to the Red Dot Cohiba, very loyal to it. Um, however, again, it's not one that I personally like. Now with the Cubans, it's it's hard to say because that's probably one of the most asked questions. Is what's your favorite? And you know it's hard to say a favorite. I can tell you you know my top five or top ten cigars that are my go-to cigars that I that I personally think are great cigars. Um, but again, that's just because I like it doesn't mean you're going to like it. Doesn't mean anyone else going to like it. I mean, who cares if I like something? It's just my palate. But um, probably a standard, uh, very, very good cigar that I think is very well priced is the Bolivar Bellicoso Fino. It is a, probably an eight to $10 cigar. I think it is an excellent quality. I think it is a wonderful tasting cigar. Um, I think the Partigas Siri P2, again, is a very, very good cigar. The Titania is a phenomenal cigar. But, I mean, I'm going to smoke a cigar. I'll walk in the humidor and it could be 20 minutes until I decide what I want to smoke. Yeah. Also, yeah. open boxes. What yeah. do I feel like? What am I in the mood for? It changes day to day. I mean, uh, you know, I would I would be horrified to have to just smoke a single cigar or a cigar brand for life. I mean, that would suck because the the beauty is oh man, boy, I, I really like that uh, uh, that Quintara the other day, or you know, the uh, Diplomatico was wonderful. Mm -hmm. Or hey, let me try this this Monte, you know, whatever. It's, it's fun for me to try different cigars and enjoy different cigars and know what I don't like. What I don't like is just support is what I do like because I avoid that profile. Okay, so now um, we'll, we'll go to the quintessential Cuban cigar that people always think about, and that is the Cohiba. So you go to Casa del Habanos. You're, you're going in there on vacation. You find one, and you want a Cohiba. What is that? What is that? perfect Cohiba, which is a, it doesn't matter a year pre-embargo, post-embargo. Well, we'll say post-embargo because it's probably easier to, to come across. But what is that Cohiba that people, if that's the cigar they want, they want a Cohiba and they want an enjoyable experience, what is the Cohiba they should be looking for? I will tell you my preference within the Cohiba line. And, okay. and as an interesting aside, 
there is no pre embargo Cohiba because Cohiba oh, was developed. Oh, that, 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 that's right. So yeah, you it doesn't that, exist. Yeah. Um, but of all of the Cohibas, if I had to tell you what my very favorite standard Cohiba was, it would be the Siglo 6. For, for whatever reason, that size, that, that blend, that bounce is, is my sweet spot. I really, really like the Siglo 6. Um, the Escondido, if it's aged well, can be a complete home run. Uh, wonderful, wonderful cigar. Um, within the other Siglo lines, the media, the um, one through five, I've had some decent ones, but and if I'm going to pick one up and buy it, it's going to be the six. That's that's just me. Okay, so, so, so I now, need to know. So if I ever come across them, that's where I'll go. Yes. Now, 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 why the six? What what is what is different about that cigar than one through five? It's it's just a blend. Um, okay. okay. It's, it's it's a size that I like too. It's a 52 ring gauge. So, oh, perfect. Yeah. You know, I I'm not the guy who's going to pop a 74 ring gauge in my mouth and smoke it. I'm just, I'm not going to get a lot of enjoyment out of that. Um, uh, I, I do like the you know some of the thinner cigars, uh, so that the Lancero, the Cohiba Lancero, is a phenomenal cigar, but. Being that it's a thin cigar, it's not very forgiving. So it has to be more exact as far as its humidity to, to have a good draw, and you have to smoke it very slowly. The six is a very forgiving cigar. It's big enough to have uh, a good burn, a good complexity, while at the same time, you don't have to sit there and pay attention, am I smoking this too fast? Is it burning too hot? Is it getting, you know, a little bit ashy because of that that heat so it just for my palate it, it, the six has been my favorite um you know i i've, I've smoked a fair amount of bahikes um the bahikes counted as a very strong cuban i do not find it as a strong cuban personally um although it is an enjoyable cigar it is not worth the 90 to 100 dollar price tag yeah. that okay they are getting today uh, again, if someone gives you a hike, enjoy it. Enjoy the hell out of it. Enjoy every puff. Uh, but would you dig in your pocket and plop down your butts for a cigar like that? Probably not. I mean, it just it's it's a good cigar, but but even given price as a as a, uh, a constant, I would still pick up a six and smoke for a bahike. Me. Okay, so um, and then uh, um, uh, uh, several people have been asking in, in the chat panel, so I'll ask it. So you walk into Havana Tranquility, you don't have any cigars on you. You have to go to the humidor. Obviously, there there are no no cigar no Cuban cigars in the humidor. What is I mean? I, and I know it's hard to say because people ask me that. What do you pick up? Well, is it morning? Is it afternoon? Is it night? What Correct. did I have? What is you know? If you can think about it right now at this moment, you just had a very full meal. You had a steak, you had potatoes, you had a vegetable, you have a cocktail that you're drinking. What is that non-Cuban cigar that you're picking up to finish off a night after a heavy meal? What is, what is your non-Cuban cigar? To me, the best consistent production non-Cuban cigar that I've had is the Padron 80th. That is my best. I, I find it the shit great. Uh, the the flavor is fantastic. The draw is always perfect. Um, it it gives me a lot of complexity. I love that cigar. The best non-Cuban that I've ever smoked is going to be a tie between the original Partagas 150 or the Davidoff Diadema that was uh, produced for his hundredth year anniversary. Those two are probably the two best non-cuban cigars neither of them are produced anymore so that's why i qualify my answer by saying this is the best i've ever had but if i walk in to have entering quote today and i want to really enjoy myself i'm going to pick up an 80th uh maduro for me it up and that's going to be my cigar all yeah. right i I've, I've been on my, my on the lookout for that uh that davidoff though because everybody says that diadema unbelievably fantastic cigar you know it so it, uh, you see you, those <laughs> Back yeah. in, uh, when Jeff when Jeff had his last of those, they were 150 a stick. Yeah, they're a nine inch cigar, and I want to say it's three and a half to four years that he sold his last one, and they are they were named by Rob Report 
as the cigar of the century was that cigar. I'll send you the link, but if you look up on Google, uh, cigar of the century, Rob report, an article will come up about the Davidoff Diadema. All right. I'll have to, I'll have to uh, send Jeff a text. I'm like, Hey, did you keep any of those cigars by chance? Cause you know, he, he's got a, 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 a massive, uh, a collection. Yeah, I'm not saying you have any, he just doesn't sell any right now. Yeah. It just doesn't sell any by any. So, um, all right, so let uh, we're, we're gonna move on to a, a couple of uh, um, Cuba now. Have you you've been to Cuba, obviously, right? Once. Oh, you've oh you've only been once. I I would figure you'd have gone more often. No, I I, I unfortunately to feed this habit that you see, I have to work. I work seven days a week, and <laughs> and, I, and I mean seven days a week, no weekend, nothing. So yeah. for, for me to take some time off took a lot. And I had an opportunity back in 2015 to go to Cuba. It was a very rare opportunity. And, and during that trip, um, uh, I, I was able to spend time with Hiroshi. And I actually was able to meet and have cigars with um, Fidel Castro's son and with Che Guevara's son. And even have their pictures. So in four days, I lived more than I had in 10 years before that. So that was the most memorable trip I've ever had in those four days I spent in Cuba. Oh wow! Um, so now, how did you go to Cuba? Is that on a? Because um, back that was under the Obama administration, correct? Correct. Yeah. yeah. So, so you were there. So that was a little bit lighter, you know, re restrictions. Correct. Yes, they had they had uh, they made travel easier. You had to get a visa, but you were able to do it through a people to people um, type of a trip. So I, I would basically I wrote a letter stating to the State Department that I wanted to go and I wanted to basically, you know, visit for a people-to-people -people cultural thing. Um, they had to file that with the State Department. I then purchased a visa from the Cuban government and got on a plane in Miami that landed directly in Havana. And uh, so it was completely above board. People go to this day, there are still ways to do it. It's tougher now than it was back when I went, 15. Um, taking COVID out of the situation, obviously, you know, no one's traveling now, but yeah. through COVID, there were still ways, but it was tougher. Um, now, anyone could still go by hopping on, you know, Hamas or Grand Cane and then, you know, hopping over that way. Because you got to remember, the Cuban government doesn't care. It's not them that is stopping Cuban travel. It is the U.S. government. So okay. They're not, they, don't, they don't stop you from going in. Just the opposite. They love it when you come in. Um, so you're not getting any issues from the Cuban side. It's the legality on the U S side. And, um, so people go to, uh, again, pre COVID people would go all the time. Um, and go, I think somewhat legally, but if not, I think government has better things to do than to track down someone who hopped a grand came in to go on a Cuban safari and have some cigars to come back. I mean, I would they have better things to do anyway. Okay, I didn't know that, that we could actually go down to Grand Cayman and then just hop a plane to Cuba. I never yeah. even thought that that was a thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. There's a lot of ways to get around the, the U.S. portion of it. Keep in mind that you are certainly breaking the law. And yeah. if you're not doing it through a sanctioned means and that you could have, you know, some penalties that go with that. I do not know the extent of what those penalties are. You know, they have two main festivals. One is in February, one is in October. And Cigar Aficionado would always cover it. And you would see celebrities and people from the U.S. were there even during the most tightest restrictions. So they went and they didn't seem to get any repercussions from that. So. All right. So, so when you're traveling, not only uh, back from Cuba, anywhere in the world, you're traveling back. What's the restriction? Because I've heard so many different things. How many Cuban cigars can you bring back? Well, I will tell you what the law states, and I can even put you to a cigar aficionado article. Um, the initially it was very restrictive. You were allowed to bring back up to one hundred dollars worth of U.S. dollars worth of Cuban goods, be it uh, alcohol or cigars, back to the state. Um, it changed that and relaxed it significantly. And the way the current rule reads is you are allowed to bring 100 cigars 
back duty free for personal consumption. But you can bring as many as you want back if you pay the duty on anything over the 100 cigars. So per the letter of the law, you could go down and you could come back with 2,000 cigars, so long as you made duty on 1,500 of those cigars. Now, when I went to Switzerland last, um, I had, I actually still have a, uh, a humidor, a private safe in a uh, store called Girard, which referred to Davidoff. Him and his father have had a store in Geneva since the 50s. And he would actually keep your cigars for you, but you won't mail them. So you got to go get them. Okay. I had some very valuable cigars that were over there, and I wrote letters. I called customs agents. I went to airports. I went to Tampa. I went to Miami physically and spoke to customs agents. And every answer I got was different. And oh, what, geez. It comes, what it comes down to is regardless of what the letter of the law says, if you're in your car and you're doing nothing legal and a cop pulls you over and gives you a lawful instruction, if you don't obey that lawful instruction, you may win in the end in court, but at that moment, you're in trouble. So I might, if I tried to bring back 2,000 cigars in one trip, and that agent says, no, you're only allowed to bring back 100, they can take those 1,900 cigars, and they're going to put them in a non-humidified yeah. uh, warehouse you know, in the middle of an airport somewhere, and it may take me six months to eventually win that legal battle, but what am I going to gain? The cigars are worthless at that point. So every single customs agent has the last word in what happens face-to-face -face with you at that airport. And that's scary, but that's the reality. I mean, I went to supervisors. I wrote Washington, D.C. I had letters back, totally noncommittal. They would say, read this part of the law. And, and, that's, and then you read the law, and it's up for interpretation. The law states, technically, 100 cigars, duty-free, pay duty on the rest. And duty's cheap, like 4%. Hmm. Okay, so, so at least 100 cigars. So you're good, yeah. at, a, you're good at 100 cigars. Yeah, I don't <clears throat> think anyone is going to question you at all. And that's going to be 100 cigars per person. So if you have a family of four, exactly, um, yeah. you're going to have no problem bringing back 100 cigars. Okay, so and then, no problem. Uh, Okay, I, um, just, just chatting with uh, um, and listening to the story, my, my buddy Omar uh, uh, Defrias with Fortello, he went to Mexico. You know, I think he brought like 200 cigars with him, you know, to give away, and uh, they hit him with six thousand uh, uh, dollar duty. You know, and uh, and then absolutely, he was able to work that down to like 800 bucks or something. But uh, but yeah, so yeah, that that's I, I don't know if I would chance it. Oh, that would just be that that would definitely be rough. So it, 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 it's it's a crash. And again, you may win you may win the war, but if you lose the battle and you get your stuff back, it's yeah. what you're gonna do. So exactly. God. So um I, I think that's all the questions that, that we actually had for you. So um we uh we, we definitely appreciate you coming on, spending uh, an hour and a half of your uh time with us tonight. Hopefully everybody is um you know, got all the information. I know I learned so much. I'm, I'm take. I mean, I got page after page of notes, and then I'll, I'll definitely go back and rewatch this. You know, because uh, I I learned so much. Yeah, I think the most interesting thing is just to learn that the the flavors that you're going to find in a Cuban cigar are much more muted than what definitely. you would find in, in anything else. I think that's the most interesting fact I learned tonight. Yeah, that was if, definitely. If, you know, if you're not a Cuban smoker. And yep. you're going to smoke a Cuban cigar, without a doubt, you need to have a fresh palate and per preferably take a break for a couple of days. Because if you're smoking, you know, the, the Liga Number no. 9 and you're smoking the Hoyo de Monre and you're smoking some of these powerhouses, yeah. um, you're not going to be able to perceive the taste. So do That's yourself a favor. definitely a good takeaway, though. Yeah. And it needs to at least be your first cigar of the day. To, to even be appreciated. Yeah. So. Because no, you guys, I'm, I'm, if they're going to drop money on a Cuban cigar and, and they don't know these things, and they're going to just think to themselves, well, shit. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely, you know, I'm definitely going to remember that. You know, just I'm, I'm going to try and take a couple of days because I want to find that that Siglo 6, I think, because Jessica's never had any uh, um, Cohibas. You know, we, we've smoked Cuban cigars, but so I'm going to yeah. look for that cigar, and I think we're going to take a, a couple of days off. That'll be our first cigar, fresh palate. 
and um, I, I think we're definitely going to try that. And um, um, yeah, see if I can get so, hands on some too. Yeah, super awesome. So, uh, uh, Dr. Emil, thank you so much for coming on thank and joining us and, 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 and giving us some of your info. So, um, and we'll awesome. definitely uh, we'll definitely see you around Havana Tranquility uh, sometime yeah. soon. All right, you have a good night. You too. Thank you. Thank you.